We have been leaders in getting economic sanctions. And, and that really has taken a toll, we're told, by most people uh, there in Yugoslavia. But it, it appears not a sufficient toll to, to solve the problems of hunger in Sarajevo, or really to set an example that I think the UN and the United States is a part of that ought to set. And, and specifically, I'm concerned about ethnic violence, which goes to full-scale warfare that could be replicated in many places of Eastern Europe and even in the former republics of the Soviet Union. What is the vital American interest here that would lead you to contemplate American military involvement in this? The vital American interest runs this way, that if ethnic warfare is the situation of choice for various groups in Europe, and given the proliferation of weapons that are readily available, and the tens of thousands of people that now seem to get into these fights, the possibility for stability uh, in Europe, it seems to me, becomes very dim. And that means that our prospects for trade, for travel, for safety of Americans, likewise grows much more dim. Worse still, the possibilities for stability in the former republics of the Soviet Union begins to become very, very difficult. Uh, and, and we have counted upon peace with our former adversary. We've counted upon people finally having a struggle economically and working hard to, and to get democracy, but if in fact they are enveloped in warfare uh, at the same time that uh, we were most hopeful something else was going to happen, uh, the implications for our security uh, and our economic security in particular uh, become much more dismal. But you are beginning to get us into the world policeman role. I mean, if uh the the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians are killing each other. Is that is that really our affair? I mean, should we have to should we have to go every time somebody wants to get into an ethnic war? No, I would hope not, and that's the reason it is useful to go one time, first time, maybe Yugoslavia. I, I suppose the point I'm making is if we don't demonstrate a capability really of saying that war is unacceptable in this situation as an international community then we are fated to have these choices and these demands again and again. We may decide some we will accept, some we won't. In other words, war is possible someplace that doesn't uh, bother us too much. I, I don't think it's going to work out that neatly in Eastern Europe or in the former Soviet Union. This is why I don't see the United States as a world policeman. I've carefully said, let's get the UN with all of the traps that you run through there first, NATO if possible, any other security organization, United States as leader, perhaps as pusher to make sure people do their duty. Why can't we just insist that the Europeans do this? I mean, it is their front yard, backyard, whatever, uh, their democracies, it's their trade, it's their stability. Why can't we just say, you know, we've, we've handled the Gulf, you handle this one? Well, we tried that, and that's been our policy in Yugoslavia. It was a European problem. The EC ought to try out to precise how they wanted to deal with it. European statesmen ought to go there. As a matter of fact, it didn't work, in part because Europeans had conflicting alliances, historically, or different views on what ought to happen. Or finally, they just didn't want to do it, even though it was in their backyard. Th this is why our role in NATO is very important. That gives us a forum to insist that they do their duty. You know, I, I'm not suggesting that the United States uh, ought to be the only participant or even the major one. I am saying that without our leadership, our spur, I doubt whether anything effective will happen at all. Do you think that the American people look at this fight as worth the blood of American soldiers? No. At, at first glance, uh, they do not. Uh, American people would take a look at this and say, uh, our shoulders are broad, but not that broad, and we're tired of it. And uh, if these people want to kill each other, that's their business. But then on second glance, the American people take a different look. It's an ambivalence. It's the same sort of problem after Desert Storm, in which uh, we had settled back, but suddenly the Kurds were being herded up into the mountains. It appeared hundreds of thousands of people, including many women and children, might simply die from lack of attention in the world. And the hue and cry came up from this country as to why the president wasn't doing something about it. Well, the, the president probably didn't intend to do anything about it. Uh, right off the bat, it wasn't our problem. But it became our problem because the American people in a humanitarian surge, quite apart from 
an economic or political interest surge, said, you know, finally when the chips are down, we don't want people to starve. And we have the wherewithal to stop that from happening. We ought to do it. So we got three divisions then, one of Mars, the other two other countries, and we saved the Kurds, literally, hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, that's, that similar cry is going to go up with, with Sarajevo. Uh, is the broader question than simply saving people from starvation there. Well, the humanitarian end of it, I can... Other. You're an, an insertion power, an invading power, if you like, and aren't U.S. Marines or whoever the troops are going to get fired on, and aren't the American people going to say then, this is more than we bargained for, let's get them out? That's probably true, and that is why concentrating on saving Sarajevo, I think, is probably not the right question to concentrate on. I think we ought to be taking a, a broader look at who is causing the fighting, who is resupplying the fighters. Uh, we ought to take a look at the Serbian government or the government of Yugoslavia or the government of Croatia or various other entities. Now, some would say, well, all the people in the fighting are not controlled by anybody's government. They just simply spontaneously shoot at each other. This is their nature. There's a lot to that, and that's the Beirut problem. And, and it may simply be that a resupply of Syria under these conditions is impossible. I, I would not risk uh, Americans uh, just simply to try to prove a point here. But I, I think that if we do the right things in terms of the UN authorization, in terms of obvious military planning by NATO and by others, and, and there is at least a will to proceed there, maybe in an indirect military action, which indicates... Such as? Uh, some type of uh, sweeping of the skies so that um, it is apparent that you don't have air control that you thought you had before. Uh, to show some credibility that we're there, mm -hmm. that, uh, that we're prepared to engage, and that's mm -hmm. that there are going to be costs mm -hmm. involved in failing to work with the rest of the world. And then at that point, I think there'll be some relief for Sarajevo. Well, what about President Bush? I mean, he's looked very reluctant to get involved in this whole thing. Is that changing? Well, the president is very prudent and very cautious about this. But the president also offered leadership at the UN to get the economic sanctions on. Not toward force, though. No, no, just economic. And the president has said, let's see how far those will take us. Now, uh, there's certain irony in that, in hoping that sanctions will do the job. In view of uh, Iraq. In view of the fact that sanctions are still on Iraq. The same ones we put on now, it seems, years ago. And uh, Saddam Hussein is, is still there, even with Desert Storm uh, intervening. So the sanctions probably make a difference. They show we're serious. And there is some evidence in, uh, in the Yugoslavian picture that the politics may be shifting against those who want to be more aggressive. Uh, and so we hope that that's the case. That, in a, in a way, is our policy now. Sanctions and a hope that political change occurs. My own view is that that probably will not be enough. The people involved in the fighting have to, to have some signs of credibility that others are prepared to use force. Is there any indication that the president is warming up to the military option? Uh, I think only in the sense that the president stated before... Uh, he, he, he took a, a trip the other day that um, we would not want people to starve, that we are a humane people, and that's, that's a very real problem on his mind. So he, he may very well have tried to think through, or his advisors, how you, how you do the relief action. But as I understand their position at this moment, is that unless the ceasefire is certain, we're not going to risk Americans in a situation in which they may get shot. And, and the, sort of a fishbowl... Uh, situation around that airport in which uh, snipers or, or even worse uh, artillery could well, but, set but, up. But what you're contemplating is some action that's larger than merely the, the immediate rescue yes. of Sarajevo. Now is there any uh, indication that the, that the White House or the Pentagon is, is planning for such an operation? Or I don't uh, see that, but uh, I'm hopeful that at the Pentagon people are thinking through the tactics, whether they really have a call to do so or not, I, it seems to me that, that that clearly is a potential for our country, but it certainly is not an actual one in terms of uh, presidential doctrine. My, my own view is that strong leadership uh, is always the best politics as well as the best government, that there is a sense right now of either drift or uncertainty as to what we ought to do, and that only the president can resolve. 
uh, the president probably will do this in due course. I would encourage him to do it soon. And I, and I think it's a strong point. When, when the president really fastens on to one of these situations, uh, he's at his best, and I think he would be in this occasion. Mm -hmm. What do you think he will do? I don't know. Uh, I, I suspect that uh, we may get lucky for a period of time, and by that I mean uh, the forces that have pinned down Sarajevo may relent. There may, in fact, be a little bit more of a UN contingent coming in all the time. Maybe even the 1,100 peacekeepers that have been trying to get there. And that would be helpful. Uh, it would certainly save a lot of lives. Maybe it would give a hiatus in which people could rethink, is there some negotiation possible here? But I'm not optimistic that that will hold without there being some credibility of our leadership. I think there will still be a looking over the shoulder there as to whether the United States is serious or whether we have, uh, have backed away from the situation. Ultimately, it seems to me, in the, even in the broader context, the debate in this country has to be about what should be the role of the United States. Uh, we keep coming up to these situations without having had the debate. Now, my, my, my own biases, I think, are clear. I think America should lead the world. I think we have the ability not to dominate, not to police, but to lead and to pull together other countries that can help us in that respect. This offers a case again, or a textbook uh, time in which we could do that. I think we should. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the president uh, will act in that stead. With the end of the Cold War, keeping the peace in Europe was supposed to become mostly Europe's problem. While U.S. military units that kept watch against a Soviet attack furled their flags, European nations crafted several new security alliances to maintain order in Central Europe. But when the first threat to peace appeared in the Yugoslav conflict, Europe failed to act. On the campaign trail, Ross Perot talks of a total disengagement from Europe unless the Europeans pay the U.S. $50 billion per year. And at the Pentagon, Defense analysts are considering a new strategy which would curtail military commitments in areas where vital U.S. interests aren't at risk. What role will the U.S. military play in the new world order? Senator Luger, you say that the United States ought to be the leader of the world and ought to be engaged in keeping the peace and so on. Do you think that the American people, now that the Cold War is over, are in a frame of mind to do that sort of thing, or wouldn't they rather spend their money and their energies on domestic repair? That is the nature of the great debate that we have to have, what our priorities will be. Uh, my own view is that in order to have the economic prosperity to which we've become accustomed, of which we want more, we will have to be leader of the world. I, I say that because I believe the expansion of our exports will depend largely upon our physical presence on other continents and our, our political leadership of the affairs of people. I don't think that we're going to do well economically uh, in trading with ourselves, nor are we going to expand our exports or have the authority we need in world trade without a physical military presence in this leadership role. I'm certain we cannot count on the seas being safe or the air or travel for Americans or ordinary pursuits that would lead us to greater prosperity through exports and through travel. With, without having this military presence that, uh, that is obvious, is not intrusive, uh, but at the same time is certain in terms of our leadership. Mm -hmm. uh, can, a, can a presidential candidate like George Bush win an election in, with the American people in their present frame of mind on that kind of a platform? Yes, I think so. In large part because the American people are, are yearning for leadership as to what our role will be in the world. How are we going to arrange this world at this time in these circumstances, we have a, a, a remarkable opportunities. Every leader who comes to it, whether it's Boris Yeltsin or John Major or what have you, says, you're number one. Uh, we, we want your leadership. We want your presence. We want your idealism. We want your money. We want all of you, in essence. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're saying we're not really sure whether that's our agenda right now. We've got a lot to do in health care and the infrastructure of our country. We're not sure how competitive we are these days have some unemployment that we've got to get rid of and a recession to get over in real estate. Well, those are all true, but I don't think they're very soluble with, without the dynamism 
dynamism of our export expansion, the jobs that come with that, our control really of our destiny in the rest of the world. And we have that opportunity and we may blow it, but it seems to me that the president's strongest suit is really to, to enunciate our place in the world. Uh, it is to lead, it is to be number one, and to do so with the grace and skill, but likewise with some wisdom and forces we need to. What do you make of the fact that Ross Perot, who has a very different sort of outlook on the world, who wants to pull back American troops from Europe unless yeah. they pay us $50 billion and doesn't want to have a North American free trade agreement and so on, he's leading in the polls. Now, doesn't that suggest the way the American people at this moment want to tilt? It suggests to me that uh, Ross Perot is offering a, a vision of sorts, or at least people think that they see the vision that uh, he's offering. I, I would hope that he really doesn't believe all of the things that, that you've suggested, because I think those would be disastrous collectively. No, he what has, I, said, well, yeah, he has I, said that. Well, I appreciate that, and, uh, but he's really not got into a good number of these things, nor tried to lead, uh, at least uh, in a world-class situation for a while. I think it's instructive uh, to note that the USA Today poll that put a three-man race between George Bush, Bill Clinton, and General Schwarzkopf it came out with Schwarzkopf having almost identical figures with Perot. Uh, the, the point I want to make is simply that Schwarzkopf is perceived as a very strong, decisive leader who knows what he wants to do, how to arrange it, and so forth. Um, it says something, I think, about the styles of the candidates for the moment. You sound like you think that the president is in danger of blowing his big opportunity. Well, it is a great opportunity. And he may feel that implicit in what he has done before, people would know that this is how he feels. But when he talked about a new world order, when he talked about leadership with regard to the Middle East and Desert Storm, that there's a track record of demonstrating going through the United Nations, the multinational, going to nations and saying, pay $50 billion to do this. An unparalleled sort of united way of collecting the funds for this. That was great leadership. So the president may say, that's already out there. I don't have to go through that. I think he probably does. I, I think, in other words, to, to universalize what was a one-time situation is probably important. And to say that's our role in the world today. Let me switch to uh, the Russian aid question. It's on the Hill. Uh, President Yeltsin made a stirring speech before Congress uh, to try to get the, uh, the, the Russian aid package broken through. Is it going to pass? It will pass, but I would hope soon rather than later. Uh, the debate within the Democratic Party, as I've mentioned, is whether it should be taken up prior to getting the urban aid done, the unemployment compensation bill, any other thing that Democrats can think of to sort of indicate the priorities. With Republicans, uh, it seems to me by now people want to support the president. A majority will vote for it. Democrats want to make sure Republicans would vote in, in a majority, that they were not mousetrapped on the IMF replenishment question, an old bugaboo. So it's something that everybody knows must occur, but we appear to be dragging our feet to say the least, and we ought to get on with it. Have we had sufficient presidential leadership on this front? Yes, uh, the president, uh, in, in I think one of the very few uh, joint bipartisan leadership groups brought everybody to the White House before he made the announcement. He has spoken frequently about it. So has Secretary Baker. They're, they're doing a good job, I think, in terms of legislative lobbying. But they have not yet gotten Senator Mitchell to bring the bill up. So hopefully that will occur this coming week. Let me switch to a different topic entirely, and that is the, uh, the Supreme Court's decision on extradition of, yeah. uh, or actually kidnapping, of, uh, of foreign nationals that, that we want to get a hold of, as in the case of Mexico. Is, was this Supreme Court decision disruptive of international law and liable to uh, ruin the United States' reputation around the world? Well, my first impression is that it's not a good decision in terms of our international relations. Uh, I, I'm not going to dispute learned justices who were citing American law and constitutional principle and coming to this unusual decision, but it just strikes me as a common sense matter that asserting that the United States has the right really to kidnap another person or another country and bring them to this country for trial begs the question, what will happen when an American is kidnapped by nationals in some other country who say we need that person for a trial in our country or somewhere else where that person ought to, to be involved? Americans will be outraged when that occurs. 
And, and yet somebody will say, well, we have uh, legal principles. You ought to read our Constitution, see what it has to say. Now, uh, Secretary Baker immediately tried to reassure the Mexicans that only under the most extreme circumstances could this ever occur, and likewise the rest of the nations of the world. But he has a tall order of explaining to do. I'm not certain how people will be reassured, nor how many really Americans are reassured by such a doctrine. It is, it is clearly a very unusual case. Somebody suggested this was a second cousin to the Ayatollahs uh, deciding to assassinate Salman Rushdie outside the country. I mean, the kidnapping is different from murder, but nonetheless, it's extraterritoriality that you can uh, uh, enforce your laws on somebody else's ground. Well, that's right. You know, we've been talking about what the role of the United States ought to be, and I've been emphasizing it isn't policemen. It shouldn't be. But, but at the same time, we're, we're ending on a topic in which... Uh, we go much farther than that. This is not police action. This is seizure of persons uh, to satisfy our own judicial system, our sense of fairness and what's appropriate. I think this is an extension that ought to be examined again. Let's look forward, final question, let's look forward six months. Uh, what do you think the administration is actually going to do as to Yugoslavia, and do you think American troops will be employed? I doubt whether American troops will be employed in a hostile situation. It's conceivable to me that uh, a ceasefire will occur. And I could not name the circumstances that lead to this, and perhaps exhaustion by the Yugoslavian people, or our desire really to be done with the warfare, as many have suggested they should. Under those circumstances, we might be a, a very small part of a peacekeeping force, but we will certainly encourage others to provide the bulk of that force and probably our expertise, uh, much more than our presence, will be involved in Yugoslavia. Mm. Senator Luger, thanks very much for being with us. Morning. For American Interests, mm. I'm Morton Kondracki. Get set to take your own journey through the stars. Stay tuned for Jack Horkheimer, the star hustler, following in a moment. The program was produced by the Blackwell Corporation, which is solely responsible for its content. Major funding for American interests is provided by Maytag Corporation, a family of companies continuing the quality tradition in home appliances and vending products throughout the world. For a video cassette of American interests, please phone the Blackwell Corporation at area code 202 223 7744. This is PBS. For a transcript of American interests, send $5 to News Transcripts, Post Office Box 34100. Washington, D.C., 20043. Please specify program topic. Police! You got the right to remain silent. There's no war on drugs. There's war on people. There is uh, no indication that the less cocaine, marijuana, or heroin is coming into the country today than it was four years ago. Why can't it be stopped? That's a question the government needs to answer. Why can't it be stopped? What price the drug war? Next on Listening to America. Tune in to Iowa Public Television Tuesday at 9. Are we going to say to those people who are disadvantaged, hey, tough apples, I got my own problems. Crisis?